in the series of the fog is lifting. You know, the first one is Islam degree, the second one is Jihad on Terrorism. The third one, which we are filming right now, is called Islam in Women. Not Women in Islam. That's not a mistake. And uh, we filmed so far in nine countries. And the film will start by some of those same Islamophobes that we brought in chapter number five. Uh, Nuri Darwish and all those, the head fielders, and, and they would say negative things about women, that Islam oppresses women, discriminates against women, locks them up at home, and, and stuff like that. And then we will shock the audience with uh, some surveys of some big institutions like Cambridge University, uh, Bridges Foundation, Discover Islam, which is also an international organization, um, IPC, Islam Presentation uh, Committee, that most converts to Islam are women. Over 75%. So the film will be about exploring the reasons why women are attracted to Islam more than men. And we filmed so far with uh, nine women, uh, converts all of them, from different backgrounds, with African Americans, with an American from a Jewish background, with uh, Greeks, Belgian, and uh, anyway, it's, it's, it will be a good one. We're working on it right now, probably by the end of April, inshallah, to be out. But right now, I'm open for any question. If you have any question about this documentary, this topic, so I welcome your questions. One question. Uh, okay. You have a question? Yes. Who else? Who else? Here, actually, ladies first. That's what the Prophet said give privileges to women. Right? This is also the Nisa'i Khayyam. So. Uh, my first question obviously, in the film, it shows that there's some um, terrorists that are legitimate in the fact that they. Um, believe they've got a goal and there's some which have taken the Quran in the wrong way so they might not be seen as legitimate. So for the ones that have, um, what methods have they already tried um, that has allowed them to see that as the last resort? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, let me tell you that uh, most Muslims want uh, have good intentions. Even those who resort to violence they want to bring change. But their problem is, they want to bring change through violent means. There are others who want to bring change, but through peaceful means. That's why I believe that who killed Bin Laden? I believe it's the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolution that killed the ideology of Al-Qaeda. And here you find that in Egypt, after the success of the Egyptian revolution, you see, I'm, I'm separating the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolution from the Syrian and from the uh, Yemenis and from the Libyan, who took, uh, uh, who, who became very bloody actually. But the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolution went very smooth and uh, there was a success in a short time. At this point, we found the colleagues of Ayman al-Zawahiri denouncing violence in Egypt, his colleagues, and making two political parties, peaceful parties. And we have seen many of the Muslim youth who were actually uh, supportive of the uh, ideology of bringing change through violent means, migrating to the other uh, side, which is, no, let's, then looks like peaceful means work. At this point, the Americans went, killing Bin Laden, throwing him in the ocean in a brutal way. Why? Why now at this point? This is the, this is, the, these are the things that I want to ask, okay? Who wants to bring the Muslim youth back to the area or to the, to the side of violence? I, I, 
I, I hate to look like a victim of the conspiracy theory, but I believe that there are conspiracies in this world. Those people, the terrorists or the radical young Muslims, okay? As we said in the film, Prophet Muhammad foretold the appearance of a group called the Hawarij. And those, are, those were a group of Muslims who resort to violence and killing with good intentions, to bring good change, by the way. And it never found the good medium to propagate in the Muslim world, except recently, during the past 60 years, when maybe we can say that uh, after imperialism, after the Muslims got rid of the occupation all over the Muslim world, when the imperialists left, they left behind them rulers who are Muslim, but they are oppressors. With the increase of oppression, this ideology started to emerge. So that's what Robert Pape was saying here, that's what Philippe Sands was saying here, is that the root causes of terrorism, even though that the politicians are trying to sell to us that the root causes are ignorance and poverty, which is not true, because number one, in Al-Qaeda was a billionaire. Number two, he has two PhDs. It is actually something else. It is injustices. So the more the injustices, the more the oppression, the more people resort towards violence, especially with the failure of the people who are trying to bring change through peaceful means. So they started to interpret some verses from the Quran, some sayings of Prophet Muhammad, which we call the Hadith, in a wrong way. Like the uh, brother who appeared here is Adam Gadan. Adam Gadan, by the way, we did not go and, and film him. Adam Gadan is the spokesman of Al-Qaeda. But this video is on YouTube, actually. He's saying that we have the law of God, which says, وَإِنْ عَاقَبْتُمْ فَعَاقِبُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا عُقِبْتُمْ بِهِ And if you punish, then let your punishment be proportionate to the wrong that has been done to you. And here he means that non-Muslims killed our civilians and killed our innocents. Therefore, according to this verse, he believes that we can kill their civilians and their innocents too. And here I said, but they did not only kill our civilians, they also raped our women in Bosnia. Can you rape them women? And I debated against people, young people from this, who belong to this ideology. And those people, all they need is someone to talk to them from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet too. But explaining it well to them. Those were like seven people that I debated with them one day in a European country. When I go to this country today, six of them, they sit with me in study circles. So all they need is someone to talk to them from the Quran and Sunnah. Okay. Uh, sir. One of my questions you've, you've kindly answered anyway. Good. Um, well, my other question was going to be, is that available to buy? Uh, yeah, actually, it's available for free on YouTube. If you type jihad on terrorism, you will find it. Yeah. Maybe if you type my name next to it, Fadl, okay, or Soliman, it, it will be the first option that YouTube. But still, if you want to buy it, buy it. <laughs> now, everything that we do is, is on YouTube, actually. Uh, sir. What would the teachings of Islam say on the idea of international intervention on a state which is considered unjust? So, if there was a state somewhere in a country which is considered to be oppressing its civilians, Good. How, does the, how does the teaching of Islam regard the idea of another state through military combat interven uh, intervening on that state? Okay, well, uh, this is uh, actually one of the uh, grounds of uh, jihad, and that was mentioned in the film, because in the film we said it, it, the main reason of jihad is to establish justice. We didn't say self-defense, because self-defense is one of the types of establishing justice, but also it can be like defending oppressed people. And in, I think in the last chapter, 
uh, the verse was mentioned which obligates jihad in this case, and the verse clearly says, and how come you don't fight for the cause of Allah and for the weak, ill-treated and oppressed among men, women and children. But the issue is, who is really oppressed? Some, and, and this is the issue. Well, some people can claim that they are going to remove oppression while they are going for oil. So the issue is, who's really oppressive? That's why there should be some kind of a system that tells that if this is allowed or not, so of course. But of course, this is one of the grounds of jihad. You have something? I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Um, a question was asked. Um, could you expand on the issue of slave girls and the allowance of having sexual relations with them, their rights as some would refer to them as concubines and equivalent to prostitution? Okay. This is a long, uh, uh, well, this is a short question, but the answer is a long answer. She's talking about slavery and concubines <coughs> and stuff like that. Number one, we cannot blame Islam for something that it did not start. Islam came to the world to find the world, masters and slaves. And Islam worked in a, in a way, in a certain way, to end slavery. But slavery is something rooted in the, in the world, in the society. You cannot end it in a year or ten years or even in twenty years. It needs time. So Islam looked at slavery as a river, which is growing. The number of slaves is growing every day. So this river is growing because it is fed from seven main sources. Number one, war. People go to war, prisoners of war become slaves. Second, debts. Someone who's indebted, when he is, when, when the time is due, and he becomes or she becomes unable to pay back to the lender, they can become the slaves of the lender. Selling kids, people can sell their kids. Kids were like just property. If someone has like 10 kids and he's poor, he can liquidate two. Uh, selling oneself, someone can give himself as a gift and go to someone and say, I'll become your slave, just shelter me and give me food, and that's it. I work for you, I'll be your slave. Uh, kidnapping. Some people were kidnapped and then they were sold as slaves. Um, heredity. Some people who were born from slaves, they are slaves. So Islam went blocking these sources in order to make the river uh, diminish and then opened drainages to drain the water quickly and dry this river so Islam uh, did not allow uh, these you know uh, uh, sources and kept two of these sources opened but uh, with some regulations which is acquiring everything else was not allowed acquiring slaves through uh, uh, war and uh, by heredity. And I'll tell you now how Islam dealt with it. Oh, good. So, uh, that was the river which is growing because of the sources that are feeding it, the seven sources that I mentioned. And then, when Islam started to block them one by one, okay, the, the river started to diminish, and then Islam started to open drainages to drain the water quickly until the slavery ended. These drainages, one of them is uh, paying the zakat. Zakat is one of the, uh, it's paying the alms. And Muslims pay the alms to different people, of course, number one, the needy, the poor, uh, and so on, but one of the ways is to buy slaves and free them on spot. So at the day when I spend my zakat, okay, if, if there were slaves, okay, at the time when there were slaves, uh, Muslims used to go to the market and buy slaves and free them on spot. So one of the ways of freeing slaves, spending the zakat. Also, uh, voluntarily freeing slaves to go to paradise. God Almighty said, 
how come he wants, in this is the Quran, he wants, he thinks that he will go to paradise if he doesn't pass the test. And how can I tell you about the real test? It is freeing a slave. Okay? There is also the master slave agreement, which is, is called the emancipation agreement. And that was actually a genius solution that Islam introduced to the world. Because in the Quran, in Surat An Nur, I think verse number 33 says that uh, if your slaves ask you for an emancipation agreement, write for them an agreement. Okay, which means that, uh, and this was introduced in the United States uh, by Muslim slaves to their uh, masters. Uh, one of them is called Abdul Aziz in Michigan. He went to his master and said, Sir, can, you, can we write an agreement together? He said, what? How can we write an agreement? You're, ju you're a slave. He said, what's wrong with that? You'll be the first party, I'm the second party. All I need from you is to tell me how much I worth. And I get, so he'll be carrying a title. He will know that he worth like $10,000. If he can bring those $10,000, the master cannot change his mind. So he can work after hours, he can solicit donations, he can borrow money, but he, he can buy his own freedom. So the Emancipation Agreement. And there is, of course, atonement from different, uh, from different uh, sins. So if someone kills someone accidentally in Islam, to seek atonement from God, there are several things to be done, but number one was to free a slave. So if I run over someone by my, with my car, and I want to seek atonement from God, the first option is, if there are still slaves, I would go and buy a slave and free him on spot. This means that in Islam, life equals freedom. Because if you kill someone accidentally, you took a life by mistake. How do you seek atonement? Give someone dead life. How? Give someone, uh, give a slave his freedom. So in Islam, life equals freedom. And there are several things themselves, which means that you can exchange them with your own prisoners of war. If they don't have, if they didn't take prisoners of war from us, maybe they can pay money and get that prisoners of war. But it didn't say enslave them or kill them. But the issue is, we see that at the time of the Prophet, some people were enslaved when they fell as captives, and some other people from other tribes were not enslaved. So this means that in Islam, basically, Muslims do not enslave prisoners of war, except if they fight tribes or people who enslave prisoners of war. And this will be like entering in, into, the, into the war based on uh, um, uh, 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 same conditions, same uh, mutual agreement. So here, those tribes who used to enslave prisoners of war, then the deal is that if you, if we also, uh, uh, take prisoners, then they will be enslaved. That's why no one from Quraysh in any battle was enslaved. Why? Because Quraysh accepted this agreement that they don't enslave Muslims if they kept, uh, capture them also as well. You may say, but that's not nice for Muslims to do, but here we're talking about war. It's not also good that uh, their soldiers enter into the uh, uh, war uh, relax because they are fighting gentlemen who don't enslave prisoners while your soldiers enter very nervously because if any one of them loses his freedom it will be forever so here it will be based on um, uh, uh, equal treatment and this in this that there was an encouragement for people for the enemies to go to a higher standard in fighting now let's talk about heredity before Islam if someone is born from a slave girl, he becomes a slave. And that was one well, of the most famous poet before Islam is Antara ibn Shaddad. He was the slave of his own father. Why? Because his mother was a slave girl. Okay? Here Islam said, no. If someone is born from a slave girl, then she will be free and he will be free also. So here we need to speak about the issue of concubines. <laughs> Islam came to the world to find another social uh, relationship that was looked at 
as a normal relationship, as a legal relationship, which is masters having relationships with their concubines. Okay? And here Islam had to choose either to end it forever or to use it to end slavery. If Islam ends this social relationship that a master can have, this social relationship which is seen as legal, like marriage, okay, with his slave girl, then slave girls will only have one choice, which is one of the, which is to marry slaves. A slave marrying a slave girl, they will bring us ten beautiful slaves. This means that the river will be growing again. But by allowing the masters to keep their uh, concubines, but putting a new ruling, which is, if the concubine becomes a mother, she's free and the kids are free. Here you are redirecting this branch, which is giving fruits in this area, to give fruits in the area of free people. Now you are decreasing slaves, increasing free people. Okay? And at the same time, you are, uh, the, the woman herself is or becomes also free. So here Islam came and he, and Islam actually um, not only redirected the branch to give fruits in the area of free people, but also uh, uh, made some rulings uh, in this that uh, it's like marriage. So if uh, uh, the man dies, she cannot just go and marry before she waits until she, you know, has uh, her uh, monthly menses and then, uh, you know, uh, and so to prove that she's not pregnant, understanding? Exactly like also free women who are married when they wait for three months before they can get married again. So Islam here came and made some rulings for this relationship and used it to end slavery with it. And at the same time, Islam had put burden on, on, on masters. If you want to have a slave, because this is the international law, it's everywhere. Islam said, well, okay, but slaves will wear from the same level of clothing, eat from the same food. You can't make special food for the slaves. They have to eat from the same food. Well, you, you buy, you know, expensive food, they would eat the same food. Uh, you, you wear, uh, you know, clothing from Ralph Lauren, maybe, they will wear Ralph Lauren, or then you don't wear. So Islam ha has made it like a burden. It's cheaper for you to hire some people to work for you than have a slave. If you lose your temper and you slap your slave, he's free automatically. And stuff like that. So excuse me, with all this, who wants to have a slave then? So Islam uh, used these things to end slavery but by time. That's why within 20 years, the word slave started to disappear or decrease significantly and a new word appeared and that was the word mawali. Mawali means the ex-slaves or ex-masters because many Muslims freed their slaves to go to paradise and help and so on and those slaves said, well, sir, I'm free to go, right? He said, yes. He said, can I still live with you and work for you? So those, those were called mawali. Mawali means the ex-slaves or ex-masters. And in Arabic language, you cannot differentiate, differentiate for, between an ex-slave and an ex-master. Okay? And this, it means allies. And, 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 uh, and so on. But anyway, just to give you a sense of to what extent slaves were equal to free people, the only time in history when slaves became rulers, kings, is the dynasty of the slaves, which lasted for more than 700 years. The kings and princes were slaves. It's called Dawlat al-Mamalik. Okay. I told you, it's long. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Okay. I have a question, sorry. Uh, okay, it's, it's his turn, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thank you for your uh, efforts and for the video and for uh, Bridges Foundation. And uh, um, it's good to see that you're using this platform of media to give yourself a voice for the Muslim community. There doesn't seem to be that much appetite, particularly in the UK media, 
and there's something to be said about media ethics. Um, play on certain words, and uh, um, it's difficult for Muslim people to have a voice really through the media. Um, I mean, obviously, using uh, creative uh, arts such as video, and, and what other uh, avenues do you suggest Muslims uh, or, or people who feel passionate about causes like well, yours? The media is the really? reason why I am doing what I'm doing right now because I was the Muslim chaplain of the American University in Washington DC one day and Prophet Muhammad was attacked on the uh, pages of the Washington Post and I responded with an article and they never published it. So after one of my khutbahs all the uh, students signed a petition to the Washington Post and I still have on my email until today the, the email that I received from the chief, not the chief, but the editor of the page, of that page, in the Washington Post, telling me why he is not going to publish my article. He said, well, if someone calls your mother a cow, do you prove to him that she's not a cow? Just punch him in the nose or ignore him. So on our behalf, on the behalf of Muslims, he decided to ignore him. Hmm. This is what we call in Arabi, the words are true, but the intentions are false. Mm -hmm. And here at this point, I discovered that the media is not open for us. It's open only to Islamophobes and maybe people who attack us. Maybe now it's changing, but slowly, very slowly. So we decided to do Bridges Foundation and talk to non-Muslims in universities, in churches, in synagogues, on the trains, everywhere. So that's what we're doing right now. And I believe that... Uh, documentaries uh, are the, the, the most important card that you play with now because if I'm a non-Muslim and I live in a country and I see, you know, explosions in the tube station or it's not nice, Yanni, of course, <laughs> to see maybe uh, uh, planes flying through buildings, I would like to know about this religion. And uh, Islam Today made a survey and they found that 86% of the American people never heard the word Islam before 9-11, 86%. Of course, I will, at this point, I, will, I, will, I would like to acquire some knowledge about Islam, but don't give me a book to read in, in, in two months. Give me a video to, to watch in one hour, understanding? So I think that we need to do more documentaries, actually. Jazakallah khair, sir. Um, could you just talk again about the third form of jihad, combative jihad, and on what grounds it's actually justified? Is it, is it based on oppression or occupation? And in that sense, is it a problem of definition? Because you could argue that you can always feel oppressed. Or okay, well, there are, there are many grounds of uh, jihad, and they are all mentioned here, by the way. One of the grounds <coughs> was mentioned also, it is to protect houses of worship of other religions which Muslims differ with, like synagogues, monasteries, and uh, churches. So this means that a Muslim will go and fight to protect a church even though we do not agree with the Christians on their creed and dogma. By the way, we don't see Jesus as God or as Son of God. We see him as a beautiful person, as a prophet like Prophet Muhammad. But we are ready to sacrifice our lives for the right of Christians to worship the way they do. So this is the issue, okay? One of the things also, it's in Surah At-Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 6, that says, And if one of the unbelievers seek refuge with you, then grant him refuge until he listens to the word of Allah. And then escort him to where he can be safe. Which means that when I escort this non-Muslim, to where he can be safe, he is now granted the protection of the Muslims, which means that I will fight anyone who attacks him, even a Muslim. And this means that I can sacrifice my life for his protection. And of course, removing oppression, and that was very clear in the verse that says, where, where, where you see that God is blaming Muslims if they don't fight to remove the oppression of the weak. And we said that the weak suffer from what? Terrorism. Because let's, let's now differentiate between violence and terrorism. What's violence? Violence is what two enemies do directly against each other. But terrorism is a subset of violence, like Robert Tape said. 
Terrorism is violence, but not directly against your enemy. It's against weak people. To put pressure on your enemy indirectly. Those people who killed half a million in Hiroshima and Nagasaki did not really have a problem with them. It's with the enemy, which was the Japanese government. So they uh, inflicted uh, violence on weak people to put pressure on the enemy indirectly. Those people who get 3,000 people in the towers in, in New York did not really have a problem with them. The problem was with the American government. So probably they did this violence to them to put pressure on the enemy indirectly. So if you agree with me that terrorism is violence but not against the enemy, it's against weak people, then when God here is blaming Muslims for not fighting to protect weak people, it means that God is blaming Muslims if they don't fight terrorism. Because weak people suffer from terrorism. Weak people are weak people. Innocent civilians are innocent civilians. This is a red line. A red line. And when the Prophet, peace be upon him, found a woman dead after one of the battles in the battlefield, he was outraged. And he said, who killed this woman? This woman wasn't fighting. He didn't say, good, because they killed Lady Sumaya a few years ago. No, he didn't see that this can be by this one. No. <coughs> innocent civilians are innocent civilians. This is the bottom line in Islam. Sir. Thank you very much, Sheikh, for this thoughtful working with you. I, I, it's not a question, it's just uh, Professor Mumtaz is here, he knows better what I'm saying. It's about uh, Bin Laden's killing and Abbottabad. I think uh, there are a couple of texts uh, which are very authentic and authoritative sources uh, in, in America, for example, William Blum, and uh, in Britain, for example, Paul Rogers. Uh, and there are leading Egyptian journalists, uh, Hassan al-Rashidi, who worked very closely with uh, in the Afghan war. He covered that war, and he uh, kind of a friendship. Uh, there are journalists like Yvonne Ridley, who was captured by Taliban, and her book in the hands of Taliban. So I just sum up. Uh, all the, the, the people in the, uh, as Professor knows this, the people in Pakistani ISI, the, the leading people who actually were on the main front, they all denied this is a one of the false flag operations, 32 false flag, flags operations, that started since from the Spanish uh, war, North American wars, Vietnam and all that, uh, you know, attacking on the ships and all that, I'm not going into detail. And secondly, I think if, uh, I, I welcome anybody, if, I think it's a bit more complex and complicated matter to say that uh, we do not have a voice at all. Uh, I think we should give credit uh, to people like John Pilger, his book, uh, The Outsiders, uh, which he, in which you can find nine uh, British journalists. One of them, his nationality was cancelled. And uh, even I find a few days ago that, he, I mean, it's all work which is not particularly about Muslims. They, they didn't single out anybody but it's about bringing in justice and, you know, voices. Uh, there are other, other people like Greg Palast and all that, but I, I have to agree that, unfortunately, these people are not being given uh, space uh, in, in, like, BBC or Al Jazeera and all that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything? Yes. Yeah, um, well, again, I just want to kind of share other brothers and sisters' sentiments and, and thank you very much for this thought provoking documentary and, and may Allah bless you in the work that you do. Um, uh, but my, my question is more around like kind of uh, uh, mainstream um, extremists uh, that uh, are kind of embedded in our uh, societies uh, as we speak. Uh, the government seems to be a different tier of, of, of how to reach and, and, and yes I believe that education is important and there's a way of kind of lobbying your councillors and leaders and so on and so forth and then again things happen hundreds and hundreds and thousands of miles away, Israel, Palestine, all that kind of stuff which sometimes it's uh, you neglect it in your heart but you physically can't do anything about it. Um, you know, we're, we're quite fortunate that Leeds is a very multicultural and a diversity and there's a lot of kind of mixed relation friends, you know, a lot of Muslim, non-Muslim friendships, uh, relationships, all that kind of stuff, you know, so they are, Muslims are very, very engaged in education and, and various other aspects, but um, 
one of the kind of problems that we have is is when we're trying to live a peaceful harmonious kind of life in our humble communities wherever we might be we get issues like the BMP and NFs and the EDF, <coughs> ADL, uh, EDF, energy supply, EDL, <laughs> can, can, can you tell about British gas, um, EDL and whatever else, all these extreme groups that, that come uh, and, 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 and kind of kick a fuss on our doorstep, which is, is, is not very good, and, and what are your kind of... Um, thoughts and, and advices yeah. to young people in particular how to handle those kind of situations because they're there in your face without any due cause or reason so what, what's your kind of advice i, in I, I that? believe that uh, only five percent of the people are on on the sides like yani you can see extremists here and maybe muslims here and 97 or 98 percent of the people are here they are pulling them and we have also to pull from them they are putting somehow, and we should also show moderation, show uh, that Islam is not a sign of backwardness, and, and, and so on. So we, we should also expose Islamophobes. Well, Islamophobes today are doing things that are making Muslims very angry. Every week there is something today. Okay, It's like, it's like a, a bullfight. You know, when they bring the bull in, the, in, in Spain, and they st he's a very peaceful bull. In the beginning, he seemed very peaceful. And then they start intimidating the bull with the red flags until the bull becomes very angry and then runs towards its death because the matador is hiding the, the dagger behind his back. That's exactly what's happening. In the beginning, it was satanic verses. And then the Danish cartoon. And then republishing the Danish cartoon everywhere, even in New Zealand. Okay? And, 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 uh, uh, and then, you know, every time there is something, uh, fitna, film fitna, in, 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 in uh, Netherlands, burning the Quran, desecrating the Quran in Guantanamo, uh, banning the hijab in France, banning the hijab in Belgium, uh, not allowing Muslims to build minarets for their houses of worship in Switzerland. Christians can have minarets, Jews can have towers for their uh, houses of worship, and Hindus and Buddhists, but not Muslims, and, and so on. So it's like a bullfight. God told you this in the Quran, and he told you, you will hear from the people who were given the book before you, and from the polytheists, many insults. What do you do? God didn't even say, rally peacefully. He said, just, in uh, tasbiru, لا تسمعون ما الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم وما الذين أشركوا أيضا كثيرا فإن تصبروا وتتقوا إن ذلك من عزم الأمور If you show patience and word of which means I, I'm even against peaceful protests against these things just let it go, let it pass and continue doing what you're doing education, educate people and expose them I, when, when the Herdfielders came here to this country and screened his film in the House of Lords, okay, Fitna. In the next month, I came here and in East London Mosque, 1,200 non-Muslims attended the uh, lecture called Islamophobia. It was, you know what we did? And it's all on, on YouTube. We did it in Hong Kong. We play for them Fitna, 17 minutes. After they finish, I ask them, how do you feel now towards Islam? Hatred, huh? I say, yes. So let me show you what he did to you. And then I bring verse by verse, and I show them. This is the verse. Those are the words that he took off. He was playing the cut and paste game in a very stupid way in his film. But Muslims don't go and educate non-Muslims about the deception of Islamophobes. They just go angry in the streets. When you go angry, they take pictures for you. Yeah. And with our beards, we don't look beautiful when we're angry. <laughs> so they use these pictures. That's what we have to do. Just expose them. Okay? Uh, okay, the lady. Representing the ladies. Uh, I think that one of the biggest myths with Islam is um, the whole effect of like, clash of cultures and that the terrorism is not just seen as against states, it might be more seen that um, with Islam, 
um, that is sort of like against westernisation. So it's sort of saying they don't like um, aspects of our culture, the westernised culture, and maybe they don't want that bring into their country, so that might be why they're against development and things like that. Mm. So sort of, how can you, because obviously some people are going to believe in that and others are, so how do you expose the true nature of whether they're against development or not? This is a very important thing. Let me tell you that Islam is the only religion in the world which is not called after someone, not called after any group of people or a tribe, not called after any geographic region, like Hinduism called after Hind, India. It's a geographic region. Judaism after the tribe of Judas. Christianity after Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Buddhism after Buddha. Islam is called after who? Muslims love Muhammad so much, but when they are called Muhammadan, they see that it's very offensive. How, why? We love him, but we're not Muhammadan, we're Muslims like him. So the issue is, <coughs> we believe that Islam is a religion of God. That God sent to the world since the first human being, until the last day on earth. So we see Jesus himself as one of the prophets of Islam. Moses as one of the prophets of Islam, and so on. So, since we see Islam as the religion of God to all people during all ages, then it has to be suitable for all of them. What is the only thing which is suitable for all people? It's water. You know, this is the only thing that people just serve you without asking you. Did anyone ever ask you, do you drink water or not? Why are you laughing? Because it's a funny question. Why is it a funny question? Because water has no color. Water doesn't smell anything. Water tastes good for all people because it's neither salty nor sweet. Then if Islam is for all people, then keep it as pure as water. The problem is when people start coloring Islam with their color. So Arabs Arabize it. Indians Indianize it. Persians Persianize it. And then they see Western culture as a danger to Islam. Who said so? Who said so? Islam is suitable for the Western culture suitable for the people in the Eskimo, so and so on. So the problem comes here when Muslims themselves cannot differentiate between what's from culture and what's from religion. This is very important. So it's, it's a mistake, by the way, that Muslims do. Westernization is not a danger to Islam. It's a danger to maybe the Arabic culture. It's a danger to the Persian culture. But Western culture itself the, let me tell you that Prophet Muhammad was an immigrant. He immigrated from Mecca to Medina. And when he left his country, uh, he left with tears in his eyes. And he said, oh Mecca, let me know that you are the dearest country to my heart. And had not your people get me out of you, I could have never left you. After eight years, it was opened back for him. But he didn't go back to live there. He stayed in the new country. And he loved it. And he said, oh Allah, bear witness that had I not been an immigrant, I could have been one of the people of Medina. And that I love the people of Medina, and if the people of Medina go in any street, I'll be going with them. And then, he even changed, listen to this, a little bit of his culture in a way that suits the people of Medina. And he blamed the Meccans. Lady Aisha was coming back from a wedding one day. He said, did you have fun? She said, yeah, we had fun. He said, what did you sing? She said, no, we didn't sing. He said, how come you don't sing? You Meccans are not in Mecca anymore. You are here in Medina, and the people of Medina love singing. Why didn't you sing for them in this wedding? Atainakum, atainakum. And he suggested a song that could have been very suitable for a wedding. Which means that a Muslim can even change his culture, but not in a way that compromises his religion. Here religion for us comes first. But religion never, never contradicts with loving a country or loving my country. So the issue is there should be no, look, the, uh, in my own opinion, 7-7 is more horrific than 9-11. Why? Because it came from inside. Came from what? From, from inside. People who were born here. This is more horrific for me. Why? Here we have to study every one of those people. 
there are yani, case studies. But 9-11, if someone sent them from abroad to do this, this is not really a problem. The problem is here. The issue is, we're talking about people who were born here, but they never felt British. This is a problem. They were not seen as British people, maybe because of their color. And same thing, alienation all the time by the teacher, by the media, by, by, by. And at the same time, their parents were not even allowed to raise them as good Muslims. So this is the issue. What I, I see that there are some good steps now in the UK to integrate Muslims, to make them feel like this is your country. I see Muslims in the, in the, in the police, I see Muslims in the airport, I see Muslims, you know, I mean, I mean working and so on. This is good, by the way. So now I think it's, it's, it's becoming better and better every day. So the more you integrate, the Muslims are integrated, the better for the country itself. Because here we need a new identity, which is the British Muslim. Not British and Muslims, no. The British Muslim. And this is the identity that should develop by time. And it is developing right now by time. <sighs> yes, sir. Uh, just I'm wondering, does Islam have a definition of terrorism? Uh, no, actually, we tried to define terrorism in the film. Did you attend the film from the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're uh, through uh, well, the word terrorism itself is a new uh, word. But let me tell you that in Arabic, it is called Irhab. Okay? And the word Turhibuna is mentioned in the Quran, by the way. <coughs> but in Arabic, it can mean terrorism or deterring people. For, let me tell you. Uh, if a, a, an, uh, an officer sees someone climbing down from a window, Carrying, you know, the old, the old picture of a, of a, of a, of a thief, huh? of a burglar, and carrying the, the, the jewelry in, on his shoulder, will he tell him, that's not good, I'll give you 10 minutes to go and return it back? Or will he just take out his gun and say, freeze, put your hands in the air, or I'll shoot you down? This is what? It's, not, it's terrorizing him. It is some kind of deterring him, and so on. So the issue is, in the Arabic language, the word that exists, but in, a, in, in two senses, either the negative one, which is throwing uh, uh, the, the uh, or uh, uh, let me tell you, how can I say this? It's targeting non-combatant civilians, okay, to push a, a political agenda, or at the same time, uh, deterring, uh, you know, thieves and, and, and criminals. But Islam itself doesn't have really a definition for terrorism. Yes. Um, you uh, discussed um, the definition of the word jihad and how it's being misused. Um, what do you think of, um, because it's used in, by academics and political scientists, yes. um, as, you know, jihadist to describe a certain group of people. Ah, yeah. uh, and there's also uh, uh, a new term, uh, Islamist, to yes. use the word Islam, yes. and a kind of um, yes, and fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. Yeah. Yes. But these specific words, jihad and Islam, mean certain things, and they're used in as to describe certain group of people as Islamist or jihadist. What what, what do these terms mean? Actually, and how do they this relate? Is why to the I word? this term? Because of the big gap between Muslims and non-Muslims. In non-Muslim countries, the word jihad makes people panic. I was in Frankfurt giving some lectures in the Frankfurt Buchmesse, the book fair. It's the biggest book fair maybe in, in <coughs> Europe. And tens of thousands are evacuating this book fair at 5 o'clock. And uh, it becomes very crowded outside. And, and uh, I wait for like half an hour for, uh, to find a place in a train to go back. You know, the train comes, the door is open, there's no place to step in. It's very crowded. And there was a German journalist waiting, waiting next to me. And he told me, uh, uh, would you like me to tell you a secret? I said, yes, well, we're in Germany, and the Germans know their secrets of their country. I thought that he would tell me, let's go and walk to a further station and take the train from there. He told me, if you want to find a place in the next train, when the door opens, shout loudly saying, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> God told me in the Quran uh, that uh, uh, if you want to go to paradise, when you are harassed verbally by an ignorant harasser, just say peace. She's been. 
Ignore him. I ignored him. He didn't like it. So he said, would you like me to tell you another secret? He said, okay. He said, if you want to be alone in the next train, when the door opens, shout saying, jihad. I'm Muslim, but I'm also Egyptian, you know, so I couldn't actually control myself. I said, would you like me to tell you a secret, young man? And you should see how his face turned very serious, because as Muslims, our secrets are different. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I, I, I said, all Muslims in the world love this word so much. He said, what? I thought only 15%. Because that's what they are told in the West, that 15% of Muslims are fanatics. He said, no. 100% of Muslims love this word. And this is the problem. When people find it a terrible word, a word that scares people, and other people love it so much, and they even use it to name their children, boys and girls. And I said, here in your country, you can find a three-year-old girl with apple rosy cheeks, blue eyes, blonde hair, and you ask her, what's your name, honey? She tells you, my name is Jihad. We use it to name our children. So either... Those people should stop hating the world, or we should stop using it to name our children. So that's why we made this film, to educate people about the word itself. That's why I called it Jihad on Terrorism, rhyming with war on terrorism, because the word, it really troubled me a lot. At the same time, saying, uh, calling terrorists or radicalists Islamists. No, if someone is an Islamist, it means that he is sticking to the fundamentals of Islam. This is good, it's not bad. But the problem here comes with uh, using words uh, to demonize some people and alienate some people. And this is the threat to the West, to Western multiculturalism, to tell people that your friend, that your friend is the enemy, your colleague is the enemy, your neighbor is the enemy. This is the threat to the West. <coughs> you had something to say? Um, yes, sorry, can you just help one final comment, because we need to clean out the room. Okay. Uh, do you have advice for non-Muslim people living in the UK to do something overt to kind of show our acceptance and our willingness to integrate with Muslim people? Wow. I huh. completely agree with how important it is, but yeah. I feel a little bit powerless. Yes. Uh, well, you know what? If you want to know how a dish tastes, don't ask someone who never tasted that dish. Ask someone who ate from that dish. Okay, same thing. If you want to know about Islam, come to us. And we actually thank you, all the non-Muslims with us here in the room. We thank you very much for coming and spending more than two hours of your life, from your lives, with us to know about our religion. Because others, many others outside, they're trying to acquire knowledge about Muslims and Islam from third parties and from other sources. No. We thank you very much for coming, allowing us to tell you about our religion and about the truth of Muslims. See, you are here. I don't think that you're very nervous now. No one would blow himself up now. And, <laughs> and if you come to the mosques, we do also in the mosques something called open houses, where we show people that no hijacking classes in the mosques and stuff like that. But this is, this is what you have. I think maybe if you show some support to them, uh, Somehow, I, I don't really know what to tell you right now, but uh, for example, in this country, there are people who are building good relationships, and there are people at the same time who are destroying the relationships. Anyway, just support the Muslims in your area, and uh, thank you all very much for yeah. coming. Please. <coughs> uh, the last uh, question by brother here. I actually feel I'm, I'm nearing retirement age. I've been in leaves all my life, even though I've gone to America and other places to study. I'm, uh, I've been in the British Army. I've boxed for England. Uh, I've, uh, I've done quite a lot of things okay. for this country. I'm well integrated. I've always been, come from practicing family. I've always been a practicing Muslim. I, I think, a great majority of people, Muslims in this country, are integrated. It's the perception of the majority, the media, that thinks about it. The fact that we speak English, the fact that we eat fish and chips, the fact, even though it has to be at last, the fact we shop at Tesco's and other places, I think that's integration. The, the, a, a lot of the media and 
the academics and the politicians, academics and politicians and others use the word integration in a very bad way. That is, they want us to assimilate. And assimilation means losing totality of your identity. And totality of our identity is not acceptable to us because we're Muslims. So therefore, we can't lose that. And that's where the problem is. Integration, we're already integrated. We're living, I'm wearing this, I'm not wearing my <laughs> Afghan uh, suit, I'm not wearing that cap. Yes. I do on a Friday. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I'm well integrated, I'm very comfortable with everything. I've been here 99% uh, of my life. I'm integrated 99% of the way, except the other bits of my stomach are there. So integration is well integrated. I can speak to you. That's such a refreshing thing to say. Sorry? That's a really refreshing thing to say. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much, everyone. Uh, once again, like the Sheikh said, thank you to all my Muslims who have come and you know taking some of their time to learn more about Islam. Uh, we'd also like to thank all Muslims who have come as well for this support and also to learn about their religion. And um, we'd like to thank the Sheikh himself, Imam Fadl Suleiman. Um, this is just for all non-Muslims. If, if any non-Muslim could just take you know a couple of minutes of their time, uh, just to stay back, stay, stay behind them. We just like to do a small interview, just asking for their opinions about the video on the talk. If if if, uh, if they don't mind, you know, spending just a few minutes. Um, Jazakallah khair for everyone. Subhanakallah wa bihamdi. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. And I'm now with uh, Chelsea. Uh, we're at the University of Leeds, uh, and uh, we've just had uh, uh, Fadl Suleiman from uh, British Foundation, uh, who's based in Egypt, uh, present his documentary called Jihad on Terrorism. And uh, Chelsea is kindly going to share some of her thoughts with us. Uh, over to you, Chelsea. Hi, I'm Chelsea. Um, I study pol politics and philosophy at Leeds University, and I'm in my second year. Um, I came here today to find out more um, about the film. I've heard a bit about it obviously on my course, but I really wanted to come and see the other point of view, um, especially because today it seemed like there's a lot of Muslims which came to watch it, um, not a lot of non-Muslims, which was quite interesting in itself. And I really think that from watching the film, it's made me realize how important that communication is and what the film intends to do, which is dispel false beliefs about Islam and so I think it's also about dispelling false beliefs on the non-Muslim part as well. So, so I mean would, did you did you learn something through the experience and the question and answer session something that you didn't know before about you know uh, Islam and its its perceptions you know as it's perceived kind of in in society in England and kind of a uh, through the media. Yeah, I think I definitely learned more about the word she had. I mean, in the film it was portrayed as being a very negative word used in our society that people are fearful by, but actually I hadn't actually perceived that word in that way. Uh, yeah, I hadn't seen it as a negative word, although what I had seen as negative might have been stemming from that whole idea was the idea of... Um, What's like your understanding so, of jihad now, uh, after the experience you've had today? Um, I think that I can see where the misconceptions of the word might have actually come from, because it seems to be, you know, the following what they believe is right in a pursuit for um, justice, in a way. But I can see that the word could be misused through, like, purification or different messages of that coming from it. So I think it's important to understand where these misconceptions are coming and to sort that out. And uh, I think your last question, I mean, what do you think you can do? What do you think other people, young people in England and Leeds around, uh, around say, the kind of in Europe generally can do to, you know, to, uh, I suppose, bring communities together and oppose this um, kind of sometimes uh, lack of uh, understanding or, uh, you know, uh, disparity between some, some, some communities, what do you think that the youth can do in the future? I think the biggest thing is just to be open 
be open to hearing another another's point of view um, and sometimes look past the perceptions um, and I think as well it's about questioning everything question the media what is given to you like when they say that everything's terrorism think why do those people believe that they are right in that act and then like this film was just great because it touched on the causes and I think with any problem in life you have to look at the causes to actually stop it otherwise what's the point in trying to help it thank you very much indeed thank you very much and now I'm with Sean at the University of Leeds and uh, we just heard uh, Fadl Suleiman of the British F uh, Foundation uh, give he, uh, uh, present his documentary Jihad on Terrorism and Sean is just going to share some of his thoughts and views about perhaps what he thought about the presentation, what his perceptions of Muslims and even the word Jihad was before and whether this, this session and experience has, has uh, coloured his views or made them think uh, any differently. Over to you, Sean. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sean. Um, I'm studying for a master's degree in um, conflict development and security and I've just started taking a course in the Middle East. Um, so I came along tonight because I wanted to clear up some misperceptions about Islam um, and generally the Middle East, so it helped me out on my course. Um, I found the talk really interesting and the video in the sense that it cleared up the word jihad for me, um, which I thought was a negative word. I now think it's something positive. Um, I learned about three types, verbal, spiritual, and combative. And I also found it really interesting when he was talking about how certain scholars in Islam cut and paste verses from the Quran to justify certain actions. And this leads to kind of greater misperceptions that I, I'm now going to be more aware of. Um, so yeah, I found it really enlightening in that sense. And um, in terms of how do you hope to take this experience in the future? I mean, you know, are you, uh, um, do you plan on sharing the knowledge through through social media or platforms or just through through your contracts how how do you think this may benefit this experience may benefit you as a person and and British society um, well I think just kind of educating yourself about Islam and you know what Muslims understand by following the Quran and how they um, live their daily lives and you can obviously communicate that to your friends and just whenever anyone um, says something that you realize is a misunderstanding you can correct them um, so yeah. I mean, would you encourage as well uh, non-Muslims to, to go to, uh, for example, mosques or events yeah, organised so by Muslims? Yeah, I've been to mosque open days. I've been to like a mosque open day before and had a look around, had a talk, and just try and find out as much as you can. Um, no matter what your kind of personal views on religion, it's good to kind of understand where other people are coming from. Increased communication is always good. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to communicate with us today. Thank you. Thank you.